Thank you for our drummers for welcoming us this, this, this morning. It's delightful to have our drumming group and services. And they are open to everyone, no experience necessary. We've got drums for you. Just come on over on Thursday afternoons and you can join in the fun. Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara. Welcome into this loving community of seekers where we strive to live with integrity, nurture wonder, and inspire the actions that transform us and transform the world. Our opening words this morning are by the Reverend Wayne B. Arneson. Take courage, friends. The way is often hard, the path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. Take courage, for deep down there is another truth. You are not alone. We come here out of our various lives, out of our various spaces, into this sanctuary where we join online and in person into one community, knowing that we are not alone as we journey through life. I'm delighted to have a whole bunch of folks joining us this morning here, including our drumming group, some singers, some readers, our worship associate, Justine Sutton, and of course, all of you who have set aside this time to nurture your spirit here together. We have a lot going on here at the Unitarian Society beyond Sunday mornings, so I'd like to extend a special welcome to any visitors or guests we have here with us. If you're joining us from home, you can sign our virtual guest book. If you're here in person, you can stop by the welcome table in the garden after the service. You can join us for a coffee and social hour afterwards, both virtually or in person. We would love to get to know you better, answer any questions you might have about this congregation, um, and help you get to know us as we get to know you. We are in the midst of our spring pledge campaign in the thick of our budget planning process, so we're asking everyone turn in your pledge renewal by May 15th and mark your calendars for that Sunday because we're going to have a special celebration after the service with music, and I hear there's going to be cake. Um, you'll have to bring your own cake if you're joining us from home, but we would love to see you there to celebrate the generosity of this community that keeps us going year after year. And as we head into this spring and summer, also save the date for our annual meeting on June 5th. And because there's an annual meeting, that also means there's a town hall discussion on May 22nd to answer all your questions about what's going to go on at the annual meeting. So this is part of our democratic process of the congregation. All the members of this congregation make this possible. Also on June 5th is our Flower Communion, one of my favorite Sundays of the year. So cultivate those blooms in your gardens and bring them with you on June 5th. With all that is going on in the world and all that is going on in our lives, I invite you now to take a breath, to settle yourself here in this shared space, to set aside whatever to-do lists or busyness you have waiting for you out in the world and allow yourself to be present fully present to this community and this our hour of worship together. Let the sound of our bell connect us. As we prepare to light our chalice this morning, I invite you, if you're at home, if you have a chalice or a candle at home, get ready to kindle that flame with us. And if you'd like to type into the chat or the comment section, chalice is lit, and the name of the street or the town you're joining us from. I'm delighted here this morning that we have people visiting us in our sanctuary that often join us online. We are truly this multi-platform community where we're accessible to people wherever you are. And so we would love to see those little sparks shining all over our community and indeed all over our world. So I'd like to invite Anna Stefano forward for our words for chalice lighting this morning. Good morning. A poem by Anne Hillman. We look with uncertainty beyond the old choices for clear-cut answers to a softer, more permeable aliveness, which is every moment at the brink of death. For something new is being born in us, 
if we but let it. We stand at a new doorway, awaiting that which comes, daring to be human creatures, vulnerable to the beauty of existence, learning to love. Every Sunday, we take a moment after we light our chalice to put an entry into our virtual hope jar, right? This is the, the time when we lift up places that we've seen hope and inspiration come into this world. We can often feel overwhelmed by the amount of bad news we get. It's time to celebrate some of the good news that we see among us. So if you've ha seen something that's brought you hope, you can type it into the chat. I invite you to share about it during coffee hour to make it visible so that we can all be inspired. And for our collective entry into our virtual hope jar this morning, I want to add um, an event that I was a participant in yesterday, the Union of Concerned Scientists. I was part of this panel discussion. They were meeting, their advisory board was meeting here in Santa Barbara, and it was inspiring to be in a room full of people thinking about how to address climate change, not just from a technical perspective, not just using the best science and information we have, but how do we use that to inspire the cultural shift that we need across the world to combat the climate crisis. It was an inspiring morning to spend with these folks, and it gave me a sense of renewed hope for all of the ways, all of the many ways people are working hard in this world to address the climate crisis among us. One of the things that brings us hope is, of course, singing together. So Matthew, will you come forward and lead us in our opening hymn, Peace Like a River? Tears like 
So this is the first Sunday of May, May 1st, May Day, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. But that, of course, also means it's time for our birthday blessings, a time when we extend our love and goodwill to everyone who's celebrating a May birthday. So if you have a birthday in May and you would like to come on up, um, we're going to pass the microphone around to anybody who wants to introduce themselves. And if you want to say what day you were born on, that's great. If you want to say how old you are, that's optional. <laughs> You can claim every single one of those years or not. And of course, we have folks who have sent us their uh, photos. So we're going to watch the photos of the people, and then we're going to pass the microphone down here and come stand in the center so that we can all see you. Come on, May birthdays. Come on up. Come on up, May birthdays. gathered up here. I'm going to pass this and if you want to just say your name and your birthday and then pass it on down and then we're going to send them a little blessing. I was born in 1935, May 4th, on my father's birthday. 
He said it was the only gift he couldn't exchange. <laughs> I'm Suzanne Fairley. I'm 87. Thank you. Can't, can't beat that one. <laughs> Alex Cole, and my birthday is on May 19th, and I'll be 83. Hi, I'm Mike Gordeski. I will be 79 on May 22nd. Hi, I'm Eric Krieger. I'll be 55 on May 5th. Hi, I'm Kate Mead. My birthday is May 4th, and I'll be 74. I'm Joe Magistad, and on May 17th, I'll be 92. <laughs> Sue Hebert, May 25th, and I'll be 87. Lynn Dow, May 9th. I was born on Mother's Day, and I'll be 78. Matthew Grissett, my birthday is May 26th, and I'll be turning 30. <laughs> Send all of your love towards these fine folks and everyone who is celebrating their birthday this month. And may this coming year unfold for you with joy, with friends to laugh with you in the good times and hold you and cry with you in the hard times. May your heart grow more loving. May your spirit grow wiser. The world is a richer place because you are in it. And we are so glad that you were born. Happy birthday. Thanks. So I'm going to invite Sharla Ford, our Director of Lifespan Religious Education, or Religious Exploration, as we like to call it around here. Come on up, Sharla. Thank you, Julia. So we are going to be playing a little game this morning, because Julia is going to be talking about principles in a little while. So we're going to start with a quiz this morning and see how many of those seven principles you all can name. I have a cheat sheet. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to. Um, I'm going to ask you just to. You don't even have to say the number, but if you can kind of shout out what you think one of the principles is about, we're going to come out to you with this card. We're going to let you read the words out, and you're going to win a special prize just for participating. All right, who's got one? What was that? The integrity. Something that sounds like. Integrity, integrity, which one is the one that has integrity in it? <laughs> oh, no. The inherent. Inherent, is that what you're thinking? Dignity. Who's, who's, okay. The inherent worth and dignity of every person. Thank you, Roy. You can just set that down on the pew. All right, who's got another one? Yes, over here. Respect. Uh, respect for the in interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Yes, that's number seven. Wonderful. Oh, I'm not handing out the prizes. Really special prizes here. You want to hand out the prizes? Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, anyone else? We're looking for an, another one. Over here, yes, Annalie thinks she has one. Truth and meaning, search for truth and meaning. Search for truth and meaning, that sounds like, boy, I should have studied before. I don't remember which number they all are. A free and responsible search for truth and meaning. That's principle number four, thank you. And she's got, here's your prize, a colorful and cheerful bookmark. The right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. Excellent. Thank you, Kyle. A couple more. Oh, oh, over here, over here. World community. The goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. And you're going to get your, your special colorful bookmark, Nancy. Okay. Tough ones, couple more. Oh, 
Very good, Joni. Acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregation. Excellent. Number three, one more. Who's got the second principle up their sleeve? Hmm. You'll still get a bookmark. <laughs> Thank you. Number two is justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Oh, you all did very well. Thank you wait, so much. What? Wait. Done. We're not done. What about number eight? Number eight? There's number a, eight. There's wait, the, the eighth principle. Where's that, where's that bookmark? There's no number eight on here. There's only seven. Well, yeah, I know there's no seven. Uh, there's seven on the bookmarks. And if you look in your hymnal, there's a cheat sheet there because they're all listed in the hymnal. There's seven of them. Huh. However, right now, Unitarian Universalists are thinking about adding a number eight. Eight's a nice round number here. And the eighth principle talks about how we need to build a safe and loving community free of racism and oppression, how we need to build the beloved community that we hope to become. The eighth principle. Well, that sounds pretty good. That's what we're going to be talking about here in the service today. And I think that's what you're going to be talking about with some of our young folks as we sing them out to their classes. I think we are. And young folks, this is something then you can talk to your parents and caregivers about on the way home because we're going to be doing parallel things here in this sanctuary and in your activities today. So let's sing you all out to your activities with our new song, We Hold You in Our Love. As I mentioned, today is May 1st, which is, of course, May Day, and I have Justine Sutton here to share with us a reading about this holiday. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I am known as Queen Justine, your friendly neighborhood pagan, here to share with you some wisdom and uh, blessings of Beltane. So you may more commonly know it as May Day. Um, when you were kids, did any of you make May Day baskets and hang them on your neighbor's door? Yeah, yeah, yeah that was a, a pretty strong tradition for a long time in our culture. It's kind of, kind of died out a little now, but people are still appreciating flowers at this time of year. Um, Beltane is, uh, comes from the uh, old Irish language, meaning good fires. Uh, bonfires were a big part of the Beltane celebration. It is, let me back up a little, it's the cross-quarter day between the spring equinox and the summer solstice. In the old pagan wheel of the year, it's the start of summer. And it's all about a celebration of abundance and fertility and joy at being outside and appreciating the natural world and, and just big celebrations. There was lots of, lots of revelry at that time. Um, also um, celebrating the sensuality of the body. Um, in order to encourage the crops to grow well, couples would go out and lie together in the fields um, as a way to kind of cheerlead, I guess, or, or set an example for the crops of how to, how to propagate well. Um, but like I said, so Beltane comes from the words for good fires. So people would build big bonfires and this was the time of year that the cattle would be driven out to their summer pastures. And for the ancient um, Irish people, cattle were very important for milk, for meat, for, you know, it was a big part of their subsistence. So they would build these two big bonfires and then drive the cattle between the fires, which was meant to purify them and bring them vitality um, for the coming season. 
Some folks now actually believe there was a practical reason for that, that the smoke from the fires may have killed ticks or other insects that were on the cattle that would harm them. So it may have actually had a, a pragmatic uh, use as well as a ritual one. So it's also uh, the celebration of the goddess Flora. Does anyone have a guess what Flora is the goddess of? <laughs> Something like this. Oops, <laughs> it takes two hands to do this. So it's traditional that at um, Beltane, a woman would be qu crowned queen of the May, and she would wear a flower crown. This flower crown is from last year's celebration we did out in the courtyard with the kids and with the RE folks, and Janie Madlani, our wonderful RE teacher, made this crown and gave it to me to wear. And I have to tell a funny story on myself. I proudly wore it all through the event, and then I was getting ready to leave, and I said, should I give this back to you? She says, oh no, you can keep it. And I said, oh, well, how long are the flowers gonna last? And she looked at me and she said, you know they're not real, right? <laughs> and because she had placed it on my head, you know, I hadn't touched it. So then when I touched it, it's like, oh, they are silk flowers, okay. <laughs> It'll last a good long time then. So yes, it was traditional for um, someone to be crowned Queen of the May, and it was also traditional, um, many of you may have taken part in this, to dance around a maypole. So the maypole would have the ribbons coming down from it, each person has a ribbon, and then you dance around it and, and braid the ribbons around the, um, around the pole. If any of you are interested in taking part in that today... No, at, at, down at Paseo Nuevo, a, a separate event, not here. Um, down at Paseo Nuevo at one o'clock, there's gonna be a Beltane celebration with a maypole put on by the Santa Barbara Revels group. They're the ones that do the wintertime show, the, the Christmas Revels. So I'm gonna be heading down there and I recommend it. It's a lot of fun. You can take part in dancing the maypole if you want to, they'll show you how to do it, or you can just uh, sit and observe and enjoy it. So to just wrap up here, let me say, um, yeah, I think I've covered all I wanted to say. So in the aspect of uh, the goddess Flora and Queen of the May, I'm going to read a Beltane blessing. And this is by Jesse Human. May flowers always line your heart and sunshine lead your way. May you never take into great account what others have to say. May fortune move to greet you should you extend a willing hand. May the friendliness of strangers show how most good things come unplanned. May the greatest of creations be how much love you're giving. May you always fill with pride for the type of life you're living. May friends and family lift you when you feel that you're alone. May their presence in your heart make you always feel at home. And should you find a heart to love that's bravely being shown, may that bravery remind you to always show your own. Thank you and blessed be on this day of Beltane. Thank you, Justine. I invite you now into a time of prayer, reflection, and quiet meditation. A time to reacquaint yourself with your breath and your body in space, in the sacred space shared amongst us, wherever we may be. We come into this space appreciating the beauty of the world and the springtime and also holding the sorrows of a world torn apart by war and greed. We make a space where all of us are welcome, all that we hold, all that we hope, all the hurts find a place for healing and the joys for sharing. So in this time of quiet, center yourself in that place of love, compassion, and gratitude. Extend that to yourself first and foremost, and then let it ripple out from here so that it may spread over the entire hurting and beautiful world, so that all may be held in the circle of care. Let us enter into a time of quiet together.
I love that the sound of the birds adding their prayers to ours filtered in. It's amazing what we notice when we quiet ourselves down. I'd like now to invite Jack and Maud to come forward uh, to share a little bit more about the eighth principle with us. Good morning. I'm Jack Reef, and this is Maud Williamson. We are from your Board of Trustees. Unitarian Universalist congregations across the country are working to adopt an eighth principle that will add an intentional commitment to building beloved community and dismantling racism to our existing seven principles. The draft of the proposed principle, crafted in a process led by BIPOC, Black Indigenous People of Color Unitarian Universalists reads as follows. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying through spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppression in ourselves and our institutions. This text has been endorsed by BLUU, which is Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism, and DRUM, Diverse Revolutionary Unitarian University, Universalism Ministries. And as of this March, it has been adopted by over 155 congregations and UU groups. Our UU principles were designed to be dynamic. They were never intended to be a religious creed. They were first articulated in the bylaws of the Unitarian Universalist Association, where the Unitarians and the Universalists merged around 1960. Along with the instruction that they be reviewed every 15 years. They were revised in 1985 to be more gender inclusive and amended again in 1995 to reflect our growing environmental awareness by adding the seventh principle. Unitarian Universalism is a living tradition, which means that as we come to new understandings about the world and how we hope to live in it, we can reflect that new awareness by changing the writing of our existing principles or adding new ones. On a national scale, the Unitarian Universalist Association has established a commission to review all of the current principles and purposes as instructed in the bylaws. The commission will present its recommendations related to the eighth principle, as well as any other revisions, to the UUA Board of Trustees in January 2023 for inclusion in the 2023 General Assembly in June. Having congregations adopt the eighth principle now indicates our support for this work, but the final recommend, revisions recommended by the commission will still need to be voted into place by delegates at the General Assembly. This is a lot of wonky process, but it's part of living into our commitment to being a democratic faith and a testimony to the uniqueness of belonging to a religious tradition that is open to change and growth. Here at the Unitarian Society, the Anti-Racism Commission, known as ARC, has worked on behalf of your trustees to create a process of discernment for us around adoption of the Eighth Principle. This will include hosting conversations at social hour, both online and in person, starting today, hosting small group discussions over the upcoming months, and a special meeting of the congregation in the fall to bring the question forward for a vote. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to anyone on the ARC team. The eighth principle came from a call from the BIPOC members of this faith, asking us to renew our commitment to this work, to hold ourselves accountable, to fulfill the potential of our existing principles, and to make our actions match our values so that we can all thrive together.
Thank you. And if you're a member of ARC, the Anti-Racism Commission, would you mind just waving or rising so that we can see who those folks are if you have any questions and you want to talk to them? There we go. These are the folks to seek out at coffee hour or afterward, after the service if you have any questions about this process. As we take up our offertory this morning, we acknowledge that we're starting a new month, which means we're finding a new outreach offering partner. Each month we partner with a project or a program that lives our values in the world. And this month we are partnering, speaking of bird song this morning, partnering with the Audubon Society of Santa Barbara. I know many of you are birders in the, this congregation and find a lot of renewal in observing uh, and connecting with the beauty of the world. And the Audubon Society helps uh, helps us preserve and protect the birds amongst us in so many, so many ways. Um, Kathleen? So, um, you may know me. I'm Kathleen Bame, and I'm a member of your Board of Trustees also. But today I've got my hat on because I'm also a board member of Santa Barbara Audubon Society. <laughs> and. Um, I want to express my appreciation to the Justice and Equity team for recognizing the work that our organization does in our community. Um, I joined Santa Barbara Audubon for practically the same reasons that I joined this society. I saw these incredible role models that were doing work to improve our world. And Santa Barbara Audubon has been doing this since 1962 when it incorporated separately from the National Audubon Organization. It's the old acting locally while you're thinking globally. And we do this by protecting the area of bird life and its habitat and to connect people with birds through education, conservation, and science. We put in 16,000 volunteer hours every year, and we don't do this just with bird walks and bird counts. Our conservation committee diligently works for conformance to environmental laws and mitigation on building proposals, wind energy, influencing policy, and getting connected with local agencies. We've researched, you know, how to and shared our information with things like regenerating our lands after forest fires and debris flows. We serve on government commissions and testify and write position papers to advocate for the birds. Our science committee manages nest boxes at Lake Los Caneros. You may have seen them and tracks the white-tailed kites and the brown pelicans in our area. It studies the waters at North Campus Open Space, which has um, redeveloped the natural waterways that were there before it was a golf course. And um, we maintain the Santa Barbara Breeding Bird Study. So our education people teach one to three grade levels about meet your wild neighbors to introduce them to birds and what birds are all about. Since the pandemic era, we've produced films uh, teaching people about the importance of birds and what they do for our environment. And we host the annual bird count for kids. So if you have children under 16, look for that next year. We just had that on April 22nd. And we have our eyes in the skies raptors. You may have seen our birds. The picture that was up at the beginning of the service was Coda, our new pe um, peregrine falcon. We lost uh, one of our peregrines and one of our owls this past year, and now Coda is our latest peregrine. And we take these raptors out to the schools, to senior centers, to special events, so that people can see these birds that can no longer fly but are taken care of in our aviary at the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum. We also, you know, distribute information 
about how to protect the birds by you know, appropriate tree trimming only in the months that end in R, and um, keeping dogs on leash to protect the breeding birds on the shorelines and rodent control without poisons. Many of you, I've looked through our member list, and many of you in our congregation are members of Santa Barbara Audubon, and I, you know, even have worked with our coming of agers to do um, habitat restoration with um, uh, up at Arroyo Hondo. So we're very interconnected. Um, so I want you to discover more about Santa Barbara Audubon Society. If you don't know it, go to our website, santabarbaraudubon.org. Look at our films, our old recorded programs, or come on Zoom to our May 25th program that's going to be about hummingbirds, shorebirds, and wildlife photography. And, or you could meet us in person. On May 14th, we're gonna be out at North Campus Open Space to celebrate the opening of the Mesa Trails um, that have been under development up to now. So, just as the canary was used to, you know, determine the health of the mines, our birds' studies are determining the health of our environment here. And I really appreciate any donations that would go to Santa Barbara Audubon. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. So please read with me the affirmation of gratitude and giving that is on the screen. Let us be grateful when we are able to give, for many do not have that privilege. And let us be grateful for those who share their gifts with us, for we are enriched by their giving. And let us be grateful even for our needs, so that we may learn from the generosity of others.
So this is an excerpt given by the Reverend Sophia Betancourt, who is an African-American univers univer Unitarian Universalist minister in 2018 at the annual General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association. Now I imagine that some of you are tired of this conversation. The work of dismantling oppression can feel endless at times. In our tiredness, we sometimes fear that speaking the truth of our own complicity somehow invalidates the good that we have done in the world. Instead, I see it as a sign of our commitment to a task that must rest on our faithfulness if it is ever to succeed. It will take a strength larger than our individual beliefs, larger even than our collective intention to reshape our surrounding culture. We seek to reform Unitarian Universalism because we can never be the bearers of love and justice that the world so desperately needs if the foundation that sustains us is still perpetuating the very problems we long to solve. The journey toward redemption is about truth-telling, lamentation, and owning our wrongs, while at the same time claiming a profound responsibility that calls us forward. We are the inheritors of the legacies of white supremacy, but also of an unimaginable grace, of certainty in the possibility of redemption, of weaving a tapestry of leadership that may not yet be what we long for, but is called to be the richest expression of humanity's sacredness. We believe in human capacity great enough, a God loving enough, values strong enough, communi communities dedicated enough, and leaders humble enough to move us toward redemption. The good news is that we are in control of what we do with our daily living. If we, each one of us, represent a missing remnant in the fabric of our collective future, then together we can lean into a possibility that we have yet to fully experience in human history, a collective wholeness, an unassailable good that is the kind of salvation I am here to fight for in the small moments of every single day. Immerse yourself unapologetically in what it means to be a Unitarian Universalist in these days. Then go back out into the world and live knowing that your faith matters. May the poetry of our hearts set us free. Thank you. May the poetry of our hearts set us free. That last line of Reverend Betancourt's sermon is as good a summation of the religious impulse as anything I have ever read. May the poetry of our hearts set us free. The religious impulse is akin to the poetic impulse, a desire to make meaning, to find the art in the everyday, to use metaphor to name truth, to help us make sense and beauty out of this experience of living. Religion and poetry have gone hand in hand for thousands of years. But there's no money in poetry, as any poet will tell you. And I don't think you are all here on this beautiful Sunday morning because it boosts your earning potential. There's no profit margin in the work of voluntary religious community. We don't come here to get rich. We come here to learn how to love the world, how to love each other better, and how to love ourselves. African-American author and social activist Bell Hook said, anytime we do the work of love, we end the work of domination. The moment we choose to love, we begin to move toward freedom to act in ways that will liberate ourselves and each other. This is a countercultural space we create here, grounded in this choice to love the world. 
And I want to ground our work about anti-racism and the eighth principle firmly in that place of love. We talk about this community being countercultural in a lot of different ways, but of course we come through these doors carrying with us all of the cultural baggage that we've been raised with. We are not exempt from the pressures of the world just because we enter this sanctuary. And conversations about race and racism are part of our larger culture at the moment, which is a good thing. The massive protests and uprisings two years ago after the murder of George Floyd galvanized the national conversation. And now, of course, we are experiencing the backlash to that awakening. But I don't think it's going out on a limb to say that the way the conversation about race and racism that is happening in the wider community, it is not usually coming from a place of love. More and more we are driven into our separate corners, shaped by the churn of the 24-hour media cycle, gotcha moments and sound bites, and perhaps more than anything else, fear. The anxiety is high. And people who care deeply about the outcome of this conversation, the stakes feel very high. Because after all, we are talking about people's lives, about violence, both emotional and physical, about telling the truth about our painful history, and about the fundamental commitments we make to one another as a society going forward. The stakes are too high to let this conversation be driven by fear by the old politics of domination and control. So how can we make this congregation, this space, this religious movement a place to have that conversation, to model having that conversation in a different way, grounded in love and hope instead of fear? How can we lovingly do the work of dismantling a broken system and building something better, more liberating, more equitable, and more joyful and compassionate. This is where embracing anti-racism work as a spiritual practice comes in. When we talk about the spiritual practice of dismantling oppression, isn't that part of what religious life has always sought to do? To ask, where does it hurt? And then provide a space for healing from the hurts of the world. Religions all over the world and throughout human history have been doing the work of identifying the places in our hearts where we are hurting and broken and grieving and scared, and then trying to create communities of care that help us heal individually and collectively from these broken and hurting places. Or at least that's what the best of the religious impulses in humanity strive to do. There are many examples of religious institutions failing and falling at this task of creating love and care. But despite these institutional failures, there's a longing for something that feels like wholeness embedded within us. And religions have offered various paths and spiritual practices to help us on that journey toward wholeness. Racism and systems of white supremacy are places where the world is fractured, where our hearts and bodies break, and so it makes sense to turn to our faith communities to help us heal and to inspire us in finding a different path forward. Our siblings of color in Unitarian Universalism have been sharing with us the hurt places for many years. The everyday experiences of living in systems not designed by them or for them, and in many cases, explicitly designed against them. We are past the point of debating whether or not racism is baked into the social and political structure of this nation. You only have to look at the history of our legal codes for the proof of that fact. We may have modified and amended and tried to soften the blows over time, but the fact remains that so much of the scaffolding of our culture was unashamedly based in the idea of white supremacy. Our BIPOC siblings have now asked us to make sure that Unitarian Universalism, this faith tradition that we love and share, can provide a spiritual home where they can do some of the healing from this hurt. A truly countercultural space. The eighth principle is asking us to examine where does it hurt 
And how can our congregations be places of healing rather than harm? Because the sad truth is that despite our best intentions, our congregations have been places of harm. We are humans. We are not perfect. Most of us were raised in this culture. Most of us, many of us, but not all of us are white. And we bring all of that into this sanctuary, all of our biases and prejudices and microaggressions. And if we are not thoughtful, if we don't do the ongoing spiritual work of self-reflection and collective reflection, we can all too easily replicate those patterns of the wider world right here at coffee hour or during our worship services. Our BIPOC Unitarian Universalist ministers have shared deeply about how hard it is to be a minister of color in a predominantly white faith. And our BIPOC UU lay leaders have shared how they have struggled to brush off feelings of being other, of being outsiders, of having to prove their places over and over again instead of being embraced from the start. I'll share with you part of a statement from Shannon Lang, a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church in Evanston, Illinois. She says, I love my congregation, but as a black woman, before I enter the doors of my church or a committee meeting, I often feel like I have to put on my armor. Chances are someone's going to say something hurtful. They're not going to mean it, but it's going to happen, and I've got to gird myself for the unintended pain that will come. I know my siblings in faith love me, and I love them too, but it has happened time and time again. And yet, despite these experiences, there's something at the heart of Unitarian Universalism that calls to people like Shannon a promise of liberating love, a promise yet unfulfilled. Much like the promises of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in our nation are yet unfulfilled. The eighth principle was brought to us by our siblings in this faith so that we can embrace the potential of Unitarian Universalism that has not yet been realized and get closer to being the beloved community that we dream about. And to get to this place, to embrace the work of anti-racism, not just as something to be taken up by our social justice team every now and then, but instead as a fundamental spiritual and moral and ethical commitment, the same way we embrace the other principles that define us, the principles of democracy, of interdependence, of the worth and dignity of every person, the right of conscience, we have to embrace the building of beloved community with the same level of commitment. Isn't that why we're here? <laughs> yeah. I mean, aren't we here to liberate ourselves from those patterns that hurt us and hurt the world? Aren't we here to replace those theologies of shame that separate people into the saved and the unsaved, the worthy and the unworthy? Aren't we here to replace those theologies of domination and dumb damnation with life-affirming theologies of love and kinship and interconnection? So we are called to do this work together individual self-reflection as well as collective institutional reflection. This is an optimistic move, my friend. The fact that the eighth principle exists at all is a sign of hope and goodwill. The BIPOC members of our faith, having articulated the ways that they have experienced hurt and frustration, they could have just left. Throwing everything out and writing Unitarian Universalism off as unchangeable and irredeemable. But they are committed to that universalist principle that nothing and no one is beyond redemption. Our universalist heritage is expressed in this idea of embracing the eighth principle to say that we have the capacity to change and grow and become the beloved community we dream about. So my friends, we're being invited to the party. We're being extended an invitation and when you get extended an invitation like this, you don't look at it and say, you know, I don't really like the font that it's written in. I'm not sure about the wording of the RSVP. No, you, you accept the invitation in the spirit in which it was given, the spirit of love and increasing connection, this invitation to journey together. That's what this is. So I'd like to offer a prayer shared by the Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism to close us out this morning. 
So together, let us pray. Let me listen to those whose voices are obscured by the unrelenting din of oppression and abuse. When I am moved to forge ahead, let me tarry and go alongside those whose humanity is questioned, threatened, and dismissed. When I am moved to lead, let me follow, that those whose leadership may look, feel, and sound, and be far different from my own. Remove me from the spirit of, well, actually, and let's argue over semantics, and we've never done it that way before. Open my heart to possibility, to fresh revelation, to a vision so big, I can only hold it and build it with you. May it be so. Blessed be and amen. Let us sing together one more time. So stay right where you are, and if you want to put your hands over your heart or hold them open, or if you want to have permission to put them on the shoulder of the person next to you or hold the hand of the person next to you, ask first. But wherever you are, get connected to that sense of larger love that holds us, moves through us, and among us, and beyond us, that sustains us in this work. And as you go out into this beautiful and heartbreaking world, May the light of love shine upon you, out from within you, be gracious unto you, and bring you peace. For this is the day we are given. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. <laughs>